Welcome back now for the news in detail. We begin from Iran, which says any attacks that attacks which will be turned into the main battlefield of the ensuing war. Earlier, Washington approved sending more American troops to bolster through the Arabia's air and missile defenses. More details in this report. Revolutionary Guards Commander Major General Hussein Salami warned any conflict would not remain limited. Addressing the media in Tehran, Salami said Iran would never allow any war to encroach upon its territory. He expressed hope that Washington would not make a strategic mistake. Earlier, the U.S. announced it will beef up its forces in Saudi Arabia in the wake of attacks on the kingdom's oil infrastructure. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper told reporters in Washington the fresh deployment will be defensive in nature. Esper says the troops are being sent at Saudi Arabia's request. He says the U.S. will speed up delivery of military equipment to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. We're calling on many other countries who would ha also have these capabilities to do two things. First of all, stand up and condemn these attacks. And secondly, look to also contribute defensive capabilities Earlier, President Trump said a military strike against Iran is always a possibility. For more on this, we have with us Mr. Aziz al a UK-based analyst. Thank you very much, Mr. Aziz, for being with us on Indus News. Mr. al Iran says any country that attacks it will be turned into the main battlefield of the ensuing war. So the Revolutionary Guard statement came after the U.S. announced it is sending troops to Saudi Arabia. So do you see any armed conflict taking place in the near future? Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for having me. I think the armed conflict that I foresee will be a very limited one, if there will be one. Uh, I do not foresee and I do not think that there will be an armed conflict of a scale of a of the... Of the, or the magnitude of uh, an Iraqi invasion or something like Desert Storm where conventional forces will have to be mobilized. I do foresee that there will be uh, some kind of um, uh, tethering and testing each other's limitations. So if there will be uh, any kind of conflict, it will be a very low-scale military conflict and it will be a very limited one. Right, Mr. Aziz, Secretary of Defense Mark Asper has said the fresh deployment in Saudi Arabia will be defensive in nature. So does this mean United States troops will only retaliate and not attack Iran? Diplomacy and the communication that's been taking place between Saudi Arabia, UAE and the United States in the past week has been very much of a, a coordinative uh, kind of effort, an effort that tried to uh, highlight potential responses in the future. Now, I do think, due to the amount of rhetoric being surrounded in the region about uh, the Saudi lack of military response or the lack of Saudi military response, um, that there is this eagerness to respond to a uh, such a drone strike uh, if it happens. Uh, with with the force in order to demonstrate the capacity uh, of the military force by uh, Saudi Arabia or UAE. But uh, in order to have these American forces deployed in Saudi Arabia for an offensive measure was not something that was going to happen. Uh, I think even though in this, this defensive uh, deployment, it is still part of this kind of posture that the United States and Saudi Arabia and the UAE are trying to pose in order to try to deter and raise the cost of such uh, limited warfare between Saudi Arabia, UAE, or in general, the Gulf and Iran. Right. Thank you for your time, Mr. Aziz al -Ghashia. Now moving on, Yemen's Houthi rebels say they plan to halt attacks on Saudi Arabia. Leading Houthi official Mahdi al mashad say the gesture is meant to bring about peace talks with the Saudis. al mashad expressed hope the Saudis will respond positively to the signal. It says the Houthis will stop aiming missile and drone attacks at the kingdom. He also warned continuing the war can lead to dangerous developments. al mashad called for Yemen's warring parties to hold negotiations for a national reconciliation. Meanwhile, Iran has denounced renewed U.S. sanctions against its central bank. 
Foreign Minister Javad Zarif says the move is an attempt to deny ordinary Iranians access to food and medicine. Speaking in New York for the UN General Assembly session, Zarif said the sanctions are dangerous and unacceptable. He called Washington's actions a sign of U.S. desperation as it is repeatedly sanctioning the same institution. Earlier, U.S. President Donald Trump said these are the highest sanctions ever imposed on a country. U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin said the central bank is Tehran's last source of funds. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has left for the United States to attend the 74th UN General Assembly session. Pakistan's permanent ambassador to the United Nations, Maliha Lodi, said Prime Minister Khan will raise the Kashmir issue at the session on 27th September. In a statement, the Foreign Office said the Premier will hold bilateral meetings with several of his counterparts. The statement said Prime Minister Khan will also attend UN summit on climate change, sustainable development and health coverage. Prime Minister Khan will meet U.S. President Donald Trump on Monday. Michelle Malik, wife of detained Kashmiri leader Yasin Malik, says Kashmir has become a nuclear flashpoint for South Asia. Speaking to a gathering in Islamabad, Malik said if the situation between India and Pakistan continues to worsen, the whole world will suffer. She said Kashmir is the oldest issue on the United Nations agenda and called for its peaceful resolution. Criticizing India's move of abrogating Kashmir's special status, Malik said Kashmiris are being persecuted in the occupied valley. The people of Indian occupied Kashmir are being asked to pay phone bills for the time that has passed since 5th of August. This is despite the fact that the valley has been under total lockdown and people have not been able to use their telephones. Kashmiri said they were unable to understand what they are being charged for as there is no service in the valley. The crushing curfew and clapdown in the valley has now entered its 48th day. Kashmiri and Sikh activists will hold anti-India protests in Houston tomorrow during Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit. The activists have already conducted a rehearsal decorating vehicles with flags and protest signs. Meanwhile, Indian troops brutally beat civilians in Kapwara during a cordon and search operation yesterday. The Kashmiri media reports Indian forces ransacked houses, damaged property and harassed civilians. The former Chief Minister of Occupied Kashmir, Mahmooba Mufti, has asked India to provide details of arrests made since August 5th. In a letter to the Indian government, she sought an answer within three days. Now in Afghanistan, security has been beefed up for the upcoming general elections. Over 500 polling stations have already been excluded for security reasons. We have more details in this report. Hundreds of workers check and recheck biometric fingerprint readers in a dusty Kabul suburb. The young employees at the Independent Election Commission are rushing through final technical preparations for the vote set for September the 28th. The Taliban have openly threatened to disrupt the polls. The stakes for the IEC are high with the question of turnout in Afghanistan's fourth presidential election. The fall of the Taliban is crucial to whether the elections are seen as fair and transparent. The photo is there are many differences between this presidential election and the last presidential election because we have worked on rules and regulations, procedures and mechanisms to prevent fraud in the upcoming elections. 
Turnout in previous polls was historically low. The United Nations estimated it at around 32% for 2009 elections, while no credible figure was available for the 2014 vote. Sensitive and non-sensitive materials of the IEC have been transferred to all provinces by the Afghan Security and Defense Forces, and the Afghan Security and Defense Forces have not encountered any security threats during the transfer. The IEC's huge complex is itself a tightly guarded fortress with four checkpoints and as many barriers to cross before visitors can access it. Now, in Hong Kong, fresh clashes have erupted after pro-democracy demonstrators threw petrol bombs at the police. To contain the situation, police fired water cannon and tear gas to disperse protesters. The protesters took to the streets after their Lenin Wall's messages were pulled down by their rivals. The protesters converged on the government offices in the town of Chiwen Moon. Police say they have arrested several demonstrators. Now, in Egypt, thousands of pro-democracy protesters have taken to the streets of Cairo. Demonstrators are demanding President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi's resignation over allegations of corruption. A huge crowd joined the demonstrations around the Hrir Square in Cairo chanting anti-Sisi slogans. Riot police fired tear gas to disperse protesters and arrested dozens. The demonstrations came after self-exiled Egyptian businessman Muhammad Ali accused the president of corruption and demanded his overthrow. El Sisi has dismissed the allegations, calling them lies. Such demonstrations are rare in Egypt after unauthorized protests were effectively banned in 2013. In Palestine, Israeli forces have wounded 74 Palestinians during weekly protests at the Gaza border. Medics say 48 demonstrators have been shot with live rounds. Palestinian officials say Israeli troops also fired tear gas and rubber bullets at the demonstrators. Dozens of protesters fell ill after inhaling tear gas. Israeli forces have killed over 300 Palestinians and wounded about 18,000 others since weekly protests began in March 2018. More news to come after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Now moving on with the news stories. Seven top Boko Haram commanders have been killed by the Nigerian army in a fierce battle around the Lake Chad region. Military officials said the operation was conducted by Nigerian troops as well as other regional forces. The spokesman said militants were fleeing to North and Central Africa after the operation in the Northeast. In the United States, four people were killed in the western state of Utah after a bus carrying Chinese tourists crashed near the National Park. Officials said the vehicle was near Bryce Canyon National Park when it veered off-road and hit a guardrail. Of the 30 people on board, 26 passengers have been taken to hospital with injuries ranging from minor to life-threatening. Authorities are investigating the cause of the crash. Meanwhile, in France, police detained 30 Yellow Vest protesters after they tried to enter the busy saint Lazare railway station in Paris. Police fired tear gas to disperse the demonstrators. Over 7,000 police officers have been deployed to handle yellow vest and climate change rallies. High living costs and fuel taxes triggered the protest against President Emmanuel Macron 10 months ago. China and the Solomon Islands have established diplomatic ties after the Pacific Island nation ditched relations with Taiwan. China's foreign ministry, Wang Yi, signed an agreement with his counterpart, Jeremia Manele, in Beijing. Manele said Solomon Islands has accepted one China policy. We have aligned our policy with international law in compliance with the UN Resolution 2758. We therefore recognize the one China policy. Meanwhile, in Spain, thousands of protesters have taken to the streets of Madrid and other cities against domestic violence. Demonstrators demanded tougher actions against partner violence. 
The protests in Spain were called after a series of rape cases and a worrying rise in the number of women killed by their partners or ex-partners. According to the Spanish Interior Ministry, over 40 women have been killed in acts of domestic violence this year. Despite anger over such cases, the far-right VOX party has called for existing domestic violence laws to be repealed. The party wants the laws to be replaced with legislation providing equal protection for men, women, children and the elderly. Spain is commemorating the 500th anniversary of Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan. Magellan led the country's first circumvention of the globe. More details in this report. Five centuries ago, a fleet set sail from Spain on a voyage around the world. It was an adventure fraught with danger, death and disputes. Spanish explorer Ferdinand Magellan set off with five ships and over 200 men to discover a new route to Indonesia's spice-rich Malucas Islands. He was killed in a fight with indigenous people on the island of Mactan, Philippines in 1521. Spaniard Juan Sebastian Elcano took the helm from here and completed the voyage with 18 other survivors from Magellan's crew. At a ceremony in the port city of San Luca de Barameda, politicians and the Navy paid tribute to the sailors. They also laid a floral wreath on the memorials of fallen naval soldiers. El que hoy se cumplen. Today marks 500 years since September 20th, 1519. This tribute to the sailors, many of whom lost their lives, but some of whom arrived at San Lucar on September 6th, 1522, allows us to not only pay homage to them, but also to feel proud of our country's history. Spanish Navy officials say Magellan's achievements are a source of pride for them. I think it's us who have to give thanks, because in one sense, the Navy considers itself the heir to these men who dared to step into the unknown and embark on an adventure of such significance 500 years ago on a day like this. So we consider ourselves more receivers than givers in this instance. Spain's Royal Mint has also produced a special edition coin to commemorate the fifth centenary. The voyage marked a significant development in human history and continues to inspire scientists and explorers today. Moscow's streets and buildings are decked with lights for the International Circle of Light Festival. A dazzling fireworks vowed the audience during the opening ceremony. More in this report. Dancing lights sparkling on the water and twinkling colorful laser beams on Moscow buildings amaze the happy visitors. Muscovites braved cold weather to witness 3D graphic designs and pyrotechnics telling stories from different cultures. Men and women cheered as they filmed the remarkable fireworks on mobile phones. The festival attracted sightseeing lovers from around the globe. I took flight from Chisinau at 7 in the morning, so I was in Moscow by midday to be here at 6 to take the first row. I have been dreaming to see this festival for three years. Lightning designers and audiovisual artists from various countries reinvented the Moscow architecture utilizing flame and laser. I came here because it is the largest stage of the festival and because of how it all reflects in the water, the scenery doubles. The four-day-long festival will last till September the 24th. After two days of trade talks in Washington, the United States has lifted punitive tariffs on over 400 Chinese products. Both Washington and Beijing say progress was made in the deputy-level dialogue. The 437 exempted Chinese products range from printed circuit boards to laminated wood flooring. 
During the talks, U.S. officials pressed China to substantially increase its purchases of American soybeans and other farm commodities. But Trump told reporters agricultural purchases are not enough to seal a trade deal. We're looking for a complete deal. I'm not looking for a partial deal. China has been starting to buy our agricultural product, if you noticed, over the last week, uh, and actually some very big purchases. But that's not what I'm looking for. We're looking for the big deal. Now let's have a look at the weather update. With the weather update, we come to the end of this bulletin. For more news and updates, keep watching in the news.